Hello, everybody. Hi there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda. Welcome to I, I Don't, Don't Know, know her. her, the podcast where we talk about women that you may not know, but you definitely should. And you will. Amanda's been telling me about this Instagram to look at. Lizzo? Which is Lizzo. Oh, I love and Lizzo. And I went in there. And she, okay, so Lizzo is, is she, so is she, she's a model. No, she's a musician. She's a musician. An incredible musician. She looks like a model. Oh, yeah. She looks like a model. Yeah. So Lizzo is, a, if you don't already know who Lizzo is, get on it because you clearly missed the boat. And uh, I have known about Lizzo for quite a few years now because Lizzo was the opening act when Sleater Kinney did their reunion tour. And they opened their oh. reunion tour here in Spokane and Lizzo opened for them. That is who you are talking about. Okay, all these pieces just get, like m- don't mind me. I'm just putting all the synapses. So together. Lizzo opened for Sleater Kinney, and I was like, one, this is an odd pairing with Sleater Kinney. Yeah. At first, that's what I th- I felt like that at first because I was like, well, this is like really hip hop like rap, and Sleater Kinney is like you know Riot Girl punk metal, mm-hmm. and then it fit very well because she was a joy to watch. She was so much fun. She was so fucking talented. She was a great, like great performer, very engaging. And after I left that, I was like, I guess I know who my new favorite artist is. (laughs) And I added her to my YouTube playlist and all that stuff. And so that was at least three years ago. And uh, I started following her on Instagram when I created my Instagram account. She was Mm -hmm. one of the first people I followed and if you don't follow her already on social media, you should definitely do so because she's a goddamn delight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I brought her up is I uh, we went out this weekend and, and hung out a little bit. And Amanda was like, did you check out that Instagram yet? And I was like, no. And so she's like, here, look at it. So she's showing me this picture. And, you know, Lizzo was a very full figured gal. And I was we were talking about leggings. We're yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. were talking about how you can't wear and prints, was, leggings with prints because your butt's too big. Yeah, you said. and I well, I was saying it's not that I can't; it's that I won't because I was like, I've got this giant ass, and I already feel like people are looking at it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, and then I'm going to put, you know, what I tell Abby, potpourri patterns on it, and then yeah, it's going to be, you know, even more obnoxious. And so I was checking out her Instagram last night, and I was like, this girl is not afraid. Nope, and. There's days where I really embrace my body type. I've got a smaller waist. I've got, you know, bigger shoulders and a bigger hips and thighs. So I'm like, oh, you know, I've got kind of an hourglass shape. Like, this is cool. And I can work it. And I've been able to, you know, turn some heads. And then there's some days where I'm like, I'm disgusting. <laughs> Why would anybody <laughs> want to touch me? It's It was really baffling for me to see somebody. I bet she gets a lot of criticism. Oh, you know she does, but she doesn't let it bother her. No, and it is like in your face and it is slapping. (laughs) I think you're referring to her very large and very supple derriere. Yes. Yes, it's my favorite part. I I (laughs) was like in awe. I was like, my God. I was like, she's not afraid. She's letting it all out there. Literally like twerking in a thong. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, like ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between. If you're going to follow Lizzo on Instagram, you better be looking for those great twerking videos that you needed in your life and you didn't know it. Because I did. Yeah. (laughs) She raises her hand. Me. (laughs) And it's always, it's been very much my, I know everybody's got a part of their body that they just aren't comfortable with or that they never like to show off or they hide it in baggy clothes or something like that. And that has always been my ass. And it's oh, it's been like this size since I was like 11 years old. And it was so hard to find pants. And it was so, it was just a the bane of my existence. And to see somebody so beautiful and so proud and just working it, I was like, it's not a bad thing. I'm trying to be more body positive for myself. And she was very much an inspiration. And yes, I started following her. <laughs> and that's why I wanted you to follow her because mm-hmm. I love, to me, she's very inspirational as well. And uh, not just because she's body positive, but because she's really funny. And she's talented as fuck. Extremely talented. Um, and 
I just, she's just a goddamn delight. She's so fucking wonderful to follow. She's funny. She's interesting. She's talented. Like my favorite. So I was showing Rita, the the video I was showing her was her um, wearing very brightly, like, or very, very patterned yoga type pants, like leggings. And, um, She's twerking to the voting booth. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so that was her. That was her election day go vote posts. And like you know, all the other celebrities are like taking selfies with their "I voted" sticker on. And here is Lizzo, literally twerking her way to the ballot box. And then after she voted, she had two "I voted" stickers and e- like one on each of her butt cheeks. She twerked <laughs> at the end. And I was like, this is the this is the pro voting video I need in my life. Yes. Not the putting the sticker on your nose and like, oh look at me, I voted. I mean I want everybody to vote and I think your selfies are all cute, don't get me wrong. I it's don't. just there needs to be a Lizzo in everyone's life and that's why Lizzo is there and I think she's wonderful. And if you haven't already purchased her music, do that because she's also a fucking amazing artist. She um her one of her newest songs that she put out uh, like a couple months ago is called Fitness, and it had the music video is wonderful. It's a whole bunch of different kind of women, like all different body types, black women and white women, and people who are mixed race and Latina, and like all these different window men, women in her video, and they're all wearing like leather bondage Ooh. uniforms, <laughs> and they're all. Um, they're all like doing something athletic and like really sexy. And the the chorus of the song says, I don't do this for you. And it like <laughs> flashes on the screen in huge bold letters, I don't do this for you. And I just loved it. It's so fun to watch. And uh, there's a girl, one of the women um, is on a pole. And Ooh. spinning around the pole, and her body is insane. I want to watch it. We're going to watch this video oh, when we're done. You have to watch <laughs> it. You have to watch it. It's so amazing, and her music is so fun. I also like that she has she has very like serious music, you know. That's mm-hmm. obviously taking on you know the bigger topics in life, but a, a, then she also has this very like irreverent, humorous side. And so she wrote this song called Where the Hell's My Phone? <laughs> and We've all been there. It is the funniest shit, too. And that one also has a really great video. And, the, like, Lizzo dances like a motherfucker. She is always dancing. She is high energy. Yeah. And she's fit, too. She's very We were fit. watching some of the videos of her working out, and we were all like, I can't do that shit. No. Yeah. She was doing, like, planks. Oh, she did this. While- no, she. Yeah being like suspended by her feet and then like like crisscrossing them it and was i was planks like on steroids i was just ta- like literally before we started recording today i was telling rita that my arms hurt from doing planks five days ago <laughs> for 30 seconds <laughs> and i just worked out this morning and i was like my thighs hurt <laughs> and here lizzo is is doing like the my most badass plank i've ever seen in my life and i, I was like i can't I won't no. even. Mm-hmm. Nope. No. But you know what? You get it, girl. Yes. Well, I um I went first last time, so I think it's your turn. I'm just going to preemptive strike and say I was really enamored by this this lady for what she did for for all ladies. She had a very tragic life, though. So just be prepared. <laughs> so we've got a mixed bag here. We've got a mixed bag here, okay. but you know what? Life is not entirely inspirational. Life is life, not entirely inspirational but did something very important. Caress Crosby. Nope, I don't know her. She invented the bra. (laughs) 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 She did the first patent on it as well. Um, She was born on April 20th, 420-yo, in 1891. Uh, She was actually born Mary Phelps Jacob in New Rochelle, New York, She was called Polly to distinguish herself from her mother, which was also, she was named Mary as well. She was the oldest daughter of William Jacob and Mary Phelps. She had two brothers, Leonard and Walter Bud Phelps, which it's like Bud. Yeah. Bud, (laughs) Polly, and Leo. (laughs) 
sounds interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like very New England, like. Is that really? To me, it's like not necessarily New England in terms of like the hoity toity part, but it's like, like Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Go get your brother, bud. <laughs> Her family was descended from a prominent New England family. Oh, look at that. I, I know. nailed it. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was laughing when you were saying that. Because Polly, oh my God, Polly had yeah. a, everything. <laughs> On her mother's side... I'm going to go through a little bit of her pedigree. On her mother's side, her seventh great-grandfather, William Phelps, departed from Plymouth, England in the 16, in 1630 and founded Dorchester, Boston. Okay. She was the granddaughter of General Walter Phelps, who commanded troops at the Civil War Battle of Antietam. On her father's side, she... Antietam, right? Is it Antietam? I was trying to remember. As soon as you said Antietam. it, I was like, I remember reading this in school and being like, how the fuck do you say this name? But I think it's Antietam. Antietam? So the Civil War Battle of Antietam. On her father's side, she included among her ancestors Robert Fulton, who developed the steamboat. I recognize that name, mm -hmm. yeah. And the Plymouth Colony's first governor, William Bradford. So her family... Very prominent. Shit. Yeah. yeah, that's a very prominent family. Inventors. If I know the names of your old ass people, then I know. Then, then you're a pretty big deal. You got money. Yeah. yeah, I know who the Fultons were. I knew who William Bradford is. So it said her family was not the richest, but her father had a superior attitude and lived, in quotations, high. <laughs> okay. And as Caress put it, to ride to hounds, sailboats, and lead cotillions. <laughs> so he fancied himself pretty important. Yeah, richy rich, yeah. She grew up in a world which was quoted by her in a world where only good smells existed. <laughs> Can I hate her? <laughs> I kind of hate her too. Is it okay if one of our people is like not somebody we like? <laughs> I think so. We can have okay. a well-rounded, and I'm glad that I'm the one that brought it to the table. <laughs> <laughs> um. What I wanted, she said, of her privileged childhood usually came to pass. Yeah, so she, she Polly was... Well, at least she set. recognized her privilege. Yeah. I guess there's a point. Her family divided their time between estates in Manhattan on 59th and 5th Avenue, in Watertown, Connecticut, and in New Rochelle, New York. She attended formal balls, Ivy League school dances, horse riding, dance lessons... Um, she attended Miss Chapin's school in New York City and then prep school in Connecticut. <laughs> Amanda's face is red, y'all. <laughs> oh, the opulence and privilege and wealth, of course. Oh, yes. Uh, in 1908, her mother died. And while she was in school, she, uh, or her mother died while she was in school in 1908. And then she met her husband in summer camp that summer. How old was she? She was like 18. Oh, okay. So future husband, they get married in about two years. Okay. Uh, she said that she would go to one, two, three balls a night, and she slept in till noon. <laughs> I know. She was a party girl. Also, like, just Please. spoiled. Yes. She graduated from school in 1910. In, uh, she was 19 years old. And Polly was preparing to attend yet another ball. So it was customary. She put on a corset that stiffened with whalebone and a restrictive tight corset cover. It flattened and jammed her breasts together. She had rather large breasts as well. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome she, to that club. <clears throat> I know. I well, Actually, I'm not part of that club. <laughs> no. no. Oh, Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you about my newest bra debacle. See, this, she was telling me about her bra debacle, by the way. And that's why the seed was kind of planted in my head. So I was like scanning and looking through stuff. So yes, tell, do tell. Well, I want to hear how she came up with the bra and then I'm going to blame her for all my <laughs> ills. <laughs> so she wore a dress with a plunging neckline that displayed her ample cleavage. But the corset cover, a... Box-like armor of whalebone and pink cordage poked out from underneath the gown, pissed her off. 
So she asked her maid, (laughs) I know, to bring me some pocket handkerchiefs and a pink ribbon. Bring the needle and thread as well. And she fashioned together the handkerchiefs with the ribbon into a simple bra so that it wouldn't show with her plunging neckline. It says uh, she was mobbed at the dance by the other girls who wanted to know how she moved so freely. And so she showed them the garment that she had made and they all wanted one. One day she received a request for one of her contraptions from a stranger. They offered her a dollar for her efforts. And she knew that she could probably make this into a business. So she filed for a patent for her invention on February 12th, 1914. And in November that year, the United States Patent and Trademark Office granted her the patent for the backless brassiere. Because before, the corsets went all the way to like your mid-shoulder shoulder blades. Because it wrapped all the way around here and around your back to cinch in the middle. I didn't know it went up that far on the back. I knew that it would go... It could go like above. The one that she's talking about is like a plait. That goes up yeah. above the breast and uses your back to like squeeze it all. Yes, away. and it yeah. squeezes the shit out of you. Yeah. Polly filed for the patent for her invention in fe- on February 12, 1914. And in November that year, the United States Patent and Trademark Office granted her pat- patent for the backless brassiere. She designed her corset covers, which covered the bosom when a woman wore a low corset with shoulder straps, which attached to the garment's upper and lower corners and wraparound laces that attach to the lower corners, which tied in the woman's front. This enabled her to wear gowns that were cut low in the back. And Polly wrote that her invention was well adapted to women of different sizes and was so efficient that it may be worn by persons engaged in violent exercise, like tennis. (laughs) (laughs) Violent exercise. Violent exercise. Tennis is not violent. I mean, it's hard, but it's not violent. I'm, well, the way well, they play I mean, it now. If, if you're Serena Williams. True story. Her design was lightweight. It was soft. It was comfortable to wear. And it naturally separated the breasts. Unlike the corset, which she said was heavy, stiff, and uncomfortable. And had the effect of creating a single monobosm effect, which we call today a uniboob. <laughs> <laughs> After her invention comes out and her patent goes through. She gets married to that summer camp boyfriend named Richard. She marries Richard and she files for a legal certificate with a Commonwealth of Massachusetts on May 19th, 1920, declaring that she was a married woman conducting a business using separate funds from her husband for a bank account. That's progressive. I thought that was very progressive. She was saying, this is my money. This is my business. And you ain't got no part of it. Exactly. <laughs> so she founded the Fashion Form Brazier Company. I hate that word, by the way, Brazier. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it sounds weird. It feels weird coming out of your mouth. I don't like it. Um, yeah, I like the short version, mm-hmm. bra. I know you're really not going to like this part. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> So her shop was located, uh, her manufacturing shop was located on Washington Street in Boston. She opened a two-woman sweatshop. Yeah. Oh, I'm horrified. That she manufactured her wireless brassiere during 1922. The location also served as a very convenient place for her affair. (laughs) Her affair? (laughs) Her affair. She's having an affair with Harry Crosby, who would become her second husband. She's scandalous. I, she is scandalous. It gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. Oh, God. <clears throat> Her current husband was fighting alcoholism, and he was in and out of sanitariums at the time. So sanitariums were basically what we call treatment centers now. Oh, but they were worse. They were worse. They would, like, wouldn't they, like, put stuff in your blood? They would, yeah, like, they would drop torture mercury you. in your eyes. Like, they, were, they thought that this was, like, free game to test on people and yeah, do and weird shit. they would tie shit. you down. I don't know. It was bad. It was bad. So he was in and out, in and out, battling pretty bad alcoholism. So Harry and Polly met at this party. Harry falls madly in love with her, pursues her pretty hard, writes her letters, sends her gifts, and she kind of doesn't know, like, should I do this or not? He pushes pretty hard. They start this affair. Uh, Harry is a trust fund kid. Mm. He's one uh, also. So Polly at this time is still very rich, very affluent, running in those circles, going to those parties. This is the party that she met Harry at. Yeah, I was going to say that's how she met them. Exactly. I mean, they, they, they ran in the same circles. It's not exactly. like she's going to meet an average Joe. <laughs> 
Yeah, pretty much. I would have preferred, but yeah. Um, so Harry is this like trust fund kid who wants what he wants when he wants it. So they start this whole thing. Um, he threatens suicide if she doesn't leave her husband. Oh, that's uh, abusive. Yeah. He's just like, I need you. I want you. And if you don't come with me, I'm going to die. So Polly agrees. She divorces her husband. Even uh, Harry's father bought him a car to try to dissuade him from this relationship. Because it was scandalous. You know, he's having an open affair with this woman. With a married woman. With a married woman. And they're very high society. So it's not something that was looked on pretty great. So with her business, she managed to secure a few orders from department stores, but her business never really took off. And Harry, who didn't like business, uh, lived off his trust fund. He wanted, you know, her close to him at all, all times, said, why don't you just sell it and we'll take the money and we'll live it up. He's possessive and gross. <clears throat> yeah, Harry's a bitch. <laughs> so she sold her brassiere patent to the Warner Brothers corset company in Bridgeport, Connecticut, for $1,500. Yes. Well, that's the end of that money, huh? Yeah. So $1,500 <laughs> at that time was about $22,000, which, I mean, is not, that's not a lot. No, not not especially considering that that, that company is about to make millions of dollars. Yes. Forever. Forever. <laughs> yeah. It's $1,500 what she sold it for. And in her later years, she said, I can't say the Brazier was ever, will ever take as great a place in history as the steamboat, but I did invent it. <laughs> um, okay. I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. I understand that the steamboat was obviously a very important invention, but the idea that the bra wasn't an equally important invention is in itself a sexist idea. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that, a clothing, a, a piece of clothing that women are required to wear every day of their lives from the moment they develop breasts, so 12, 13 years old, mm -hmm. until they die. Mm -hmm. That's pretty fucking important to me. And to a lot of women. You know, it's like, I don't know who invented the shoe, but obviously we think that's an important invention. <laughs> I don't know who invented pants. I like pants. I like pants too. I wear them every day. Levi Strauss invented jeans. I hope I'm saying it. <laughs> saying it anyway. <laughs> so Harry's just a bad influence and gets her to sell her company. They end up moving to Paris and living it up, running around in those social circles over there, spending money, getting drunk, partying. Um, lo and behold, Harry starts to cheat on her. Oh, mm. yeah, I'm shocked. Super shocked. Numerous affairs, drinking, partying. Harry convinces Polly to change her name to remain anonymous through their scandalous lifestyle. <laughs> okay, wait. Is she also participating in, like, affairs or something? Why is it scandalous that she's doing these? She is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Harry's cheating on her multiple times. She eventually starts doing her own thing. And the way that they drank, the way that they they were kind of socializing, too, in Paris with, like, artists kind of... Lucy goosey people. Lucy goosey people, yeah. <laughs> My kind of vagrants. <laughs> Those are the funnest people. They have the best drugs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they he suggested or they came up with two different names. One of them was literally like clitoris. Oh yes, my God. it was spelled with like a Y though. It was like C L Y T O R I S clitoris. Oh, my God. Yes. And then there was caress, which they spell C-A-R-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Okay. Yeah. So. I was she wondering chooses... how she went from Polly to caress. Also, yeah. her original name was Mary. This bitch has too many <laughs> fucking names. She's a little. You know, she's a little weird. She's a little weird. Yeah. Caress. Yeah. So um, caress and Harry decide to start publishing literature. They've got this. They've got Harry's trust fund money. Erotica? They are around are all these. Are they going to publish erotica? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> no, I, Let I, me I, finish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is exciting. <laughs> so they have, you know, Harry's trust fund money. They're meeting all these people, and Polly starts actually writing her herself, or caress now, as I can call her. Caress, caress. 
um, they start a publishing company and they publish her first book, which I want to read this shit. <laughs> it's called Crosses of Gold in late 1924. And this is still in the 20s, which is insane mm-hmm. to me. Um, it was a volume of conventional, unadventurous poetry, though, is what it was. Uh, oh, well, why would you want to read that? I don't know. But I want to I want to see what was in her brain. <laughs> but it's poetry centering on the ideas of love, beauty, and her husband. They seem like they have a really fucking twisted relationship. Yeah, yeah they seem strange. <laughs> One of their first editions called Editions Narcisse. After their black whippet, Narcisse Noir, <laughs> was published. The do- A whippet like the dog? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you... Okay. They used the press as an avenue to publish their own poetry in small editions of finely made hardbound volumes. It sounds like they were like, let's be poets, okay? And then they... It's the first <laughs> vanity publishing company. Yes. Their first effort was Carice's Painted Shores, in which she wrote about their relationship, including their reconciliation after one of his affairs. So she's writing a lot about her relationship with Harry. Um, Her writing matured somewhat, and the book was more creatively organized than her prior efforts. So maybe she's grown a little bit. She's learning a little bit. In 1928, she wrote an epic poem, which was published as The Stranger. The writing is addressed to the men in her life, her father, her husband, her son, Oh, by the way, they had a son. In an experimental fashion, she explored the various kinds of love she had known. Later that year, Impossible Melodies explored similar themes. The Crosbys enjoyed a positive reception from their initial work and decided to expand the press to serve other authors. Harry, in numerous affairs, got into a relationship with this young girl that he got obsessed with. She was in a relationship with another man. It was very dramatic it was very overwhelming they were drinking a ton harry ends up committing suicide with this girl with the girl like they with, committed suicide together yes how young are we talking by the way um there so the 1928 they're about in their 30s no but how young is the girl how young was the girl so harry was um one of the Pieces of information I found was Harry was involved with young girls. Like one was even recorded as young as 14 years old. Oh, gross. Yeah. So Harry, mm, yeah. Oh, gross. I know. This girl that he was having the affair with did not say how young she was. It just said his junior. So I'm Mm -hmm. assuming a young gal. Yeah, young. Yeah, impressionable. Young enough to commit suicide with him, which is some Romeo and Juliet bullshit. Exactly. He wrote Caress a poem and left it there for her when they found they found their bodies together, a bullet hole in each of their heads. And the poem was called Death is Our Marriage. Oh, God. I know. That's the shadiest that, shade of all time. I know. So, but Harry did leave Caress about $100,000. Oh, cool. It's a whopping <laughs> amount of money. How long have they been married at this point? Um, They have been married. I think their relationship was about, it was within 10 years. So not very long. Not very long. Not very long. So in Paris in 1933, um, Caress, with this money, she's still writing. She's starting to harbor other writers and trying to get her publishing company going. She meets Henry Miller. Oh, the Henry Miller. The Henry Miller, yes. Um, He... Confessed to Caress that his lack of success was getting in the way of getting any of, like, just a decent published book. Um, That book, Tropic of Cancer, which was very controversial because it was pretty sexual and pornographic. um, Yeah, that was. Couldn't get it, couldn't get it off the ground. So she invited him to take a room in her New York City apartment on the Upper East Side where she let him live. She just said, live there. Go ahead and write. We'll, we'll get your works taken care of. She never gave him any money, um, but he was able to live there, and that's where he continued to get his works published in New York. So she helped with the efforts of Henry Miller's writings. She also met Irma, or she also published a not-so-popular work by Ernest Hemingway, and she also published James Joyce. Wow. Yeah, These so are some, some pretty, big names. Yeah, big names. She decided to go back to her name, Mary. 
She was done with Polly. She was done with Caress. <laughs> <clears throat> she was, yeah. So she went back to Mary. She decided to experiment as a dancer for a little while. She thought, here we go. <laughs> she is fascinating. Yeah. Meanwhile, she's still really partying it up. Still the social butterfly. She's going to all the hip, whatever she can go to, traveling, Um experimented as a dancer she was in two films experimental films that did not take off she failed as a dancer she it just didn't take off for her well what do you know with no formal training you can't just pick up a fucking (laughs) career in dancing um at this time she decided to start an affair with a black actor slash boxer named canada lee I don't know who that is either. (laughs) I don't know who that is either. Um, He did some minor films, but he was a pretty successful boxer. But it was really scandalous for this socialite. This white white socialite in the like, what, 1940s, 30s? 30s. 1930s, whose husband just committed suicide with his lover. And now she's (laughs) like, I'm going to start blatant. These people are messy. (laughs) I like their mess. So she... And I feel like she was maybe addicted to drama because they were, it was illegal for them to be seen in public. And she openly took him to lunch in Harlem. Well, I imagine it would be easier to take him to lunch in Harlem. But then like they would gallivant. That was during the Harlem Renaissance. Right? 1933? I think so. Because I think the 20s and 30s were the Harlem Renaissance. His family was not happy. And her family was not happy. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I'm sure his family was... I mean, this is my impression, is that she has toys. Mm-hmm. Everything she does is for play. Mm-hmm. And money. The, br- the bra, toy. The publishing company, a toy. Her two marriages, toys. This guy, it's just another reason for people to look at her. Mm-hmm. Another something to wear, something to play yeah, with. I don't and like it's her. it's dangerous for him. Yeah. yeah, it would be far more dangerous for him. He had a lot more to lose mm-hmm. than she did because she was going to still have money and come out unscathed. Mm-hmm. He might be killed for it. Mm-hmm. So when I started this, I was like, cool, you know, something that really contributed to, you know, the net, like our, our very fibers of being women. You yeah. Know? Like you said, it's something we wear every day. But then I just like went into her history and I was like, I don't know if I like her or not or and that's why I actually, I talked to Amanda before we started recording because I really didn't like most of her story, but I was like, not everybody's story is pretty. And Amanda was right. You know, not, it's not always what we want to hear, but it is part of our history and it is someone I don't know. So. Yeah. I, I feel that way about Margaret Sanger. She was the one who. Was that the based, Planned Parenthood? Yeah. Planned Parenthood. And. You know, she was very racist. I didn't know that about her. Yeah. Yeah, extremely. Like, she believed in eugenics. Whoa. Yeah. So, Yikes. she did She did incredible, wonderful, amazing things to progress women's health. But there's an asterisk next yeah. to her name for the rest of history. So she has this relationship with this actor, Canada Lee, and she has an altercation with his family. His brother tells her to her face. It just said that he said some disparaging remarks and basically tells her this relationship's not okay. You know, my brother's at risk, blah, blah, blah. So she ends up breaking up the relationship, saying that his brother didn't respect her, his family didn't respect her and the relationship. So she doesn't speak to him ever again. She cuts him out of her life. Well, that's probably in his best interest. (laughs) Yeah. So leaves New York. She moves to Hollywood to become an actress. <laughs> I am just rolling my eyes forever at this woman. <laughs> she ends up marrying Bert Saffold, who is 18 years her junior. Well, at least girl can still get it. Yeah. And, and I did see photos of her and she was quite pretty. You know, she was she looked like a party girl, you know, Um. So, yeah, she remarries, um, but lo and behold, that relationship doesn't last very long either. But her and that husband, like, they still were flying that socialite life. Like, they even had an audience with Salvador Dali, like, invited him over. So she was doing the social kind of the new hip crazy artist, new writers, things like that. She was still dabbling in that. So 
It was really hard for me to find after she was married to Bert what happened to her. The one thing I could find was how she died. So she got heart disease and she did an experimental surgery at the Mayo Clinic that didn't help very much because they were obviously it was experimental and she died from complications of pneumonia in Italy because she got done with her surgery. She traveled to Italy to recover because that's that's what what rich rich people people do. (laughs) They go to the ocean side. And after that, her publishing company failed and that was it for her. And actually it mentioned too that her son died. Oh wow. Yeah. So that was the end end for her. And uh, and what what year was it that she died? This was in 1970. Well, she lived a long time. She lived a long time. She was 78 years old. Yeah. I mean mm-hmm. she definitely lived it to its fullest, I would say. I mean, she was always on to the next thing. Mhm. And I know it's kind of like not a very happy story, but not all of our stories are happy. I don't think it's necessarily unhappy. She clearly liked what she was doing. Mm -hmm. I think she just happens to be one of those people, and we know we've all met them, Mm -hmm. that like to be the center of attention and nothing is ever shiny enough. Mm -hmm. That's what she seems like to me. Yep. So when you put that bra on, (laughs) just remember caress. Okay, so um, my person is a little more wholesome than yours. <laughs> she, ain't, she ain't a high affluent slut. <laughs> and, but I also was really, I love sluts. <laughs> we both have been sluts. Oh, I am a slut. <laughs> uh, I also, though, was like, I'm not sure if I want to do this person. But my reason was completely different from yours. Okay. Mine was, I think she's too well known. Oh. So I texted, like, tons of people, like... Do you know who this person is off the top of your head? Do not look it up. (laughs) And everybody said no, except for the last person I asked. And then I realized that, of course, she would know for a number of reasons. So Hmm. I'm going to talk about Wilma Rudolph. I don't know her. The fastest woman in the world. I might know her. (laughs) (laughs) So Wilma was born June 23rd, 1940 in St. Bethlehem, Tennessee to Ed and Blanche Rudolph. She was uh, born prematurely. She weighed only four and a half pounds. Whoa. That's a tiny baby. She was tiny, tiny, tiny. She was the 20th of 22 children. Dear God. Right? I was like, that sperm is prolific. (laughs) <laughs> so uh he had her father had been married twice so the the 22 children are spread across two marriages i don't care i know i agree <laughs> You're so but i was control. like i think if i were his wife i'd be like get your penis away from me yeah <laughs> you're gonna impregnate me again i would say like after number f- i i mean two is too much or for me personally two is like oh, okay three is too much by four if i got pregnant for a fifth time i'd be like somebody's getting Chopped. Snip, snip. Somebody, yeah. So it was 1940 when she was born. Uh, Ed, her father, was a railroad porter, and her mother, Blanche, worked as a maid and as a homemaker. Um, from the start, though, Wilma was a premature baby, and she was very a very sickly child. At age four, she contracted double pneumonia and scarlet fever simultaneously. Jeez. And she nearly died at that time. And then at age five, she developed polio. Oh, my God. Which caused infantile paralysis. And she ended up recovering from polio, but it left her left leg crooked and her foot curved. Oh, wow. And the doctor um, said that she would never walk again. In fact, Wilma said this. My doctor told me I would never walk again. My mother told me I would. I believed my mother. Oh, that's awesome. She's, yeah, she's pretty incredible. Rudolph was, um, this is a black family. I don't think I mentioned that yet. And Rudolph, the family is living in the Jim Crow era segregated South. Okay. Which meant that she didn't have very, ac- very, very quality access to health care. And this is a little black girl that needs extra medical care. Yeah, special. And so she, she doesn't have access to a lot of that. 
at this time. And of course, they're not wealthy. I mean, 22 children. There's no way you're going to be wealthy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So twice a week for two years, Wilma's mother would take her on a segregated bus to Meharry Medical College, an all-black med school and hospital that was 50 miles away from their home in Clarksville. And at that med school, they would perform treatments on Wilma's leg. And then every day they would come home, those two, so she would do that two times a week. Okay. So 100 miles each time. Jeez. So 200 miles a week. She had to pay for that bus ticket to take Wilma to this medical college. And so at home, she was like, well, I'm going through a lot to make sure that you're getting these treatments. Mm -hmm. And so at home, she would have, she would watch what like the doctors were doing. And she would have her, like there was so many siblings. The kids had to do that stuff to Wilma as well. Okay. So when she would get home, her parents and her siblings would massage her leg and do ice and heat treatments on her leg. Oh. And she was also fitted with a leg brace and an orthopedic shoe that allowed her to walk. So the treatments were working. She was al- she could put weight on it. She was able to walk, but she had to have a brace on and a special shoe. So she could walk straight? So that, No, she, just so she could walk, oh, period. Okay. To support her leg, because her leg was extremely weak. Okay. It Basically, what had happened from the polio and the paralysis is that it had atrophied her muscles. Okay. And so she couldn't, she couldn't put weight on it. That's why they were like, you'll never walk again, and you basically have a useless leg. And uh, but but through the, these treatments and this diligent effort on the behalf of her family, she was able to walk with a brace and a special shoe. But she hated the brace, and she would constantly tried to take it off. So all of those like <laughs> twenty one other siblings yeah. were always on the lookout to make sure that she keep her, <laughs> she would keep her brace on. Um. So in between the ages of four and seven. In addition to her bouts with pneumonia, polio, and scarlet fever, she contracted whooping cough, chicken pox, and the measles. Jeez, this girl's got it all. She was very sickly. She had a variety packet of illness. So all of these illnesses and her constant treatments in Nashville caused her to not be able to go to school. So for the first two years of school, kindergarten and first grade, she was homeschooled by her mother. And she didn't end up going to school, public school, full-time until she was seven years old and she entered the second grade. So you would think she'd be behind. Yeah. No. She didn't let that hold her back. (laughs) And in addition, at the age of six, she started to hop on one leg. And by the age of eight, she started to walk without her leg brace. And all the while, her family was still massaging her leg every day and making sure that she could gain strength in her leg. And one day when she was 11... Wilma's mom found her outside playing basketball in her bare feet. Oh, wow. And that was the end of her special shoe and the beginning of her rise to athletic stardom. (laughs) She started playing basketball in the eighth grade and was soon one of the stars of the team. She actually even tried out for the high school team at age 13. Wow. She attended Clarksville's all-black high school, which was called Burt High School, and she excelled in both basketball and track. In fact, in her sophomore year of high school, she scored 803 points during the season. Shit. 803. How do you do that? Uh, In one game alone, she scored 49 points. Wow. So she was... Get it, girl. She was an incredible basketball player. Uh, Her basketball coach was a guy named C.C. Gray, and he nicknamed her Skeeter (laughs) because he said, you're little, you're fast, and you always get in my way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I love it. That is awesome. Uh, And that nickname stuck with her for life. (laughs) It was always like in the papers and stuff, they would call her Wilma Skeeter Rudolph. (laughs) She ran on the high school track team for fun, just to basically stay in shape for basketball. Um, but she, that wasn't her passion. Basketball had her older sister play basketball and her brothers were playing basketball. So she wanted to play basketball and mm-hmm. track was sort of an afterthought. During her sophomore year, though, of high school, Ed Temple, Tennessee State University's women's track coach, scouted Wilma at a basketball game and invited her to attend a summer training camp. At the camp, she started to condition herself to run like an elite runner before she just like ran however she felt like running. Yeah. And here she started to figure out how to run. Mm -hmm. And she competed in her first major track event at Alabama's Tuskegee Institute. And she lost, but it gave her the competitive bug. 
So after that, she attended the Amateur Athletic Union track meet in Philadelphia, where she won all nine events that she competed in. What? Basically, her second track meet ever, she won every single thing she was in. Nine events, too. That's Jeez, a lot of fucking events. That's a lot of events. Wilma continued to train with Tennessee State University's Tiger Bells, and that was the women's track team, while she was in high school. So she's training with these college athletes under the coaching of Ed Temple. And Ed Temple was not getting paid for that. Wow. And he would, I read somewhere that he would take the girls to track meets on his own. He would like rent a van and drive them because the school wouldn't provide transportation for women's athletes. And that right there is a good coach. Goes above and beyond and makes sure that these kids get the opportunity that they work for. He was intense. I read a thing about how um, he ran a really tight program, and if you showed up late, mm-hmm. he would make you run a lap for every minute you were late. And one time, Wilma was 30 minutes late. She, oh, had, to gosh, run she had to run 30, 30 laps. laps. And then he said, well, the next day she showed up 30 minutes early. Well, there you go. Oh, oh gosh, I, know. I wish more coaches would do that with kids. Honestly. I don't know, man. It makes you hate the sport. Like... I, I, I work with a coach, so I coach track now, and I've coached cross country for a long time, and I work with a coach who taught me something really important a long time ago, and she said, I hate using running as a punishment. Oh. And I was like, oh. It's one of those things, like, whenever I've had a therapist who said something super obvious, but it, like, turned a light bulb on for me, mm-hmm. I realized, oh, shit, you're right. I shouldn't do that. Because it puts a bad taste in their mouth? Because why would I, like, why would I want to compete in a sport that is a punishment? True. So, I, I, you know, I get where he's coming from. He's trying to instill timeliness and respect and whatever, but I still think, Nick makes his, my my husband's a football coach, and uh, the kids this year were very lippy. (laughs) So, they were, they would talk back and... He'd make them run. He'd say, go, take a lap. And they'd be bitching the whole way. They'd come back, well, I just said, go take a lap. Then, well, go take a lap. Then they were quiet. <laughs> the rest of practice. So my thing now, instead of making them run extra, is I make them do push-ups. Yeah? Push-ups aren't a sport. Mm-hmm. Make <laughs> them do tuck jumps. <laughs> yeah. So um, she was 16 and a junior in high school when Ed Temple took uh, a whole bunch of Tiger Bells and uh, other members of the Tennessee State University track teams to the U.S. Olympic track and field tryouts in C- Seattle, Washington. Ooh, go Seattle. Yeah. Wilma qualified for the individual 200-meter race and became the youngest member of the U.S. Olympic team. Wow. How old was she? 16. Fuck. And she's barely been running. Yeah. She, she started running for Ed Temple that year. Hmm. And is uh, qualified for a, the 200 meter event. Uh, she was one of five Tiger Bells who qualified to race in the 1956 Summer Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. So this guy was a good coach. Yeah. And uh, not just a good coach in terms of what he was teaching them, but he was recruiting these women. Mm-hmm. So he and, could see also. Yeah, he could see talent mm-hmm. and he picked out talent. And he actually came to the the high school that Wilma was at looking for talent and that's when he spotted her and the the most detailed description i found was that she was playing basketball and he could see that she was a fast runner and so he put her on a track and he said i want to see you run she would skip school time sometimes to go run track oh my goodness just for fun can you imagine that i skipped school today why (laughs) to run (laughs) to run on a track in a circle (laughs) oh Wilma's family was poor. They didn't have a lot of money, but her community wanted to send her to Melbourne in, in, in style. So they all banded together and bought her really nice luggage and clothes so she wouldn't look out of place when she went to the Olympics. Aww. She she was defeated in the semifinals at the Olympics, so she didn't actually get to run the 200-meter race in the finals. But Ed Temple put her on the third leg of the 4 by 100 relay team and that won the bronze medal. Oh, wow. The whole team, all four of them, were Tiger Bells. 
Wilma was after that. She got that t- that taste, that Olympic taste, and she wanted to go back to the Olympics. That's competition at its greatest. Yeah, she was determined to train harder and return to the Olympics in 1960. So four years. That's what her goal was. She was like, in four years, I want to come back and I'm going to fucking kick your asses. <laughs> So she co- she went back to Clarksville uh, to finish up high school with a bronze medal in hand, showed it off to her classmates, like, I want a look bronze at, gold medal. I want a bronze medal at the Olympics. <laughs> what did you do this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she continued to run track, and she earned a scholarship to attend Tennessee State University. Oh, that's a good school. So what I, well, that's where, that's where she'd been training, right? Mm-hmm. Was TSU. And what I read was, is that Ed Temple personally secured her an athletic scholarship but that at the time the university athletic department did not ever financially support female athletes wow and so all of the girls who ran on that track team who were by the way all of them olympic medalists yeah had to um do what they called work aid oh my god which I think today would be work study, yeah. right? So that they could go to college. So I mean, she had to work um, and go to college and train to be an Olympic athlete and be a member of the college team. Jeez. So she's she's a hard worker, and that's what he wanted from his um, student, from his kids. Yeah. However, her senior year of high school, she became pregnant. Nope. It happens. It does. But if you can you imagine being an Olymp- like headed to the Olympics, headed to the Olympics, and yeah, that, that would be a tough choice to make. It would be, and uh, she had been known this. He was kind of a, a childhood sweetheart, mm-hmm. um, so his name was Robert Eldridge, and she gave birth to her daughter Yolanda that summer. Okay, so that would be the summer of 1958. Her parents were as supportive of her pregnancy as they could be. But they were not supportive at all of her relationship with Robert, and they wanted him out of her life. Oh, was he a bad influence, or or just because he knocked her up? I, I I think it's probably because of the the fact that they had premarital sex, and yeah, it resulted in this pregnancy and is derailing potentially derailing her entire life. True, that would be if a pretty that was big my reason. child. I'd be like, hey, you know what? She's going places, and leave her alone, and you're dragging her down. Yeah. Uh, so they eventually pushed him out of her life. Oh. And Wilma would be the first. So she was supposed to be the first person in their entire family to ever go to college. Mm-hmm. And Ed Temple, the coach, had a no mother policy. Oh, no. So that put Wilma in jeopardy of not reaching her full potential. So her parents, her whole family sort of like ganged up on her and took her baby and gave what? it to one of her sisters, Yvonne, who lived in St. Louis. And so they wanted Yvonne to care for and raise this baby. And Wilma would go on with the rest of her life. Wilma have a choice? Not really. So Jeez. Wilma was really upset. Obviously. As was her boyfriend, Robert. Mm-hmm. And so uh, unbeknownst to her family, they were like, getting together in, in like the dead of night and they hatched a plan to go take back their baby. Oh, good. <laughs> so they did. They drove in the middle of the night all the way to St. Louis and they took her baby back. It was very dramatic. And after that, um, they were like, well, we can't do that. We can't, I guess we can't leave the baby in because Wilma would never have, never be able to see that baby. Mm-hmm. And so um, they decided Okay, well, we won't do that, but we still want you to go to college, and you cannot focus on college and becoming an Olympic athlete. If you're taking care of a baby, take care of a baby. You just can't. So, a more uh, amenable arrangement for her was that instead of her sister Yvonne taking care of the baby in St. Louis, her mother in Clarksville, which is okay. about fifty miles away. That's manageable. Yeah, that's yeah. an hour drive. You can still see yeah. her. So that's how they worked that out is basically for those first few years of her life, Yolanda was raised by Wilma's parents. Okay. After giving birth, Wilma said that she was faster than she'd ever been. (laughs) And it was true. Her body, 
I actually imagine that it was po- a positive change for her for her body because people talked about how when she was at the 1956 Olympics, which she didn't do very well at, mm-hmm. she was only like 89 pounds and almost six feet tall. Oh, geez. Yeah, so she was like this little string bean. Mm-hmm. And so when she gave, you know, she obviously was pregnant, gained weight for pregnancy and was able to, they called bulk bulk up mm-hmm. to a whopping 130 pounds gasp <laughs> <laughs> but by this point she is six she's i think a little over six feet tall mm-hmm. and 130 pounds and that um that ability to be like she has a little bit more muscle mass right mm-hmm. she has more weight on her actually helped her speed up it does change your abdomen too having a baby does it make it stronger i felt like because when i ran when i was a kid or you know in my early 20s it just felt different. And then after having a baby, I felt like I, I had a little bit more, um, I don't know, like tightness to my center than That's I did cool. before. Yeah. A little it just, more it core strength? Good. Yeah, a little more core strength. I mean, carrying a bowling ball for nine months might do that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so during college, she competed at the Pan America Games in Chicago, where she won a silver medal in the 100 meter race and a gold in the four by 100 relay. Ooh. She also won the AAU title and I, that's association of American universities or something like that. The AAU title in the 100 meter race in 1959, which she repeated all four years that she was in college. So no one was able to beat her 100 meter. She was the winner of the 100 meter in the AAU title every single year. Wow. She also, uh, during college won three indoor track titles so she was pretty multi-talented so not only did she win the 200 meter aau title she also set the world record wow so she competed she completed the 200 meter race in 22.9 seconds jeez that is fast that it's two i mean that's two laps around the track i mean that's a lot that's i mean not two laps around the track but 200 meters so you saying how tall is she a little over six feet. A little over six feet. So her gait is pretty broad. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, one thing that I found really fascinating is she she ran in a way that we, like, as an, as a coach, teach people not to run. Really? Yeah. She runs with her whole head, like, up and back, and her whole back is arched like this. Like, she's like a U. Oh, yeah. Uh, a sideways U. And... You know, you're supposed to keep your head forward, chin down, you know? Yeah. Well, they teach you now to spring from foot to knee to hip. So she had a very, like, no one else ran like her. Huh. It's not like it was like that was the time. Yeah. When she it would win races, she no went. one else looked like her. The media crowned her at that point the fastest woman in the world. So as a member of the university track team, she had to travel, right? Mm-hmm. And they would often compete in towns that were segregated. And the black athletes were forced to stay in different house housing than the white teams. And Tennessee State University was a historically black college at the time. Yeah. So it was everybody from that university had to stay in subpar housing. Hmm. So while she's a sophomore at the university, so it's, it's now 1960, she competed in the Olympic trials in Abilene, Texas, where she qualified to race in the 100, 200, and 4x100 relay. So she's going to the Olympics in three events. Jeez. And at the 1960 Games in Rome, the day before she was set to compete in the 100-meter race, which was her race, that was the one she was really... Yeah, what happened? She stepped in a hole and twisted her ankle. No! And it immediately swelled and bruised. So they were not sure if she was going to be able to compete. But she went, she went to the event. She stepped on the track. And the entire crowd in Rome is chanting, Vilma, Vilma, <laughs> Vilma. <laughs> and she ran the 100 meter race in 11.3 seconds. Jeez. Which was supposed to kind of be a world record set, but they, they didn't consider it a world record because they said she was aided by the wind. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> that pisses me off. It made me mad too. I was like aided by the wind. Yeah. Yeah. So Wilma was the first American woman to win the 100 meter dash since 1936, <laughs> which is a big deal. So the 1936 Olympics, do you know anything about those? Mm-mm. 
that was the year that the Olympics were in Berlin when Hitler had taken over Germany and the Nazis were on the rise. Okay, yeah. And that was the year that Jesse Owens, who was a black man, competed on the Olympic American Olympic team mm -hmm. and Hitler refused to shake his hand. And Wilma, when she started racing in track, track and field, that Jesse Owens became her idol and her hero. So it's pretty great and fitting that it, she is the first woman, American woman, to win the 100-meter dash since that year. That's awesome. And she ended up setting a new Olympic record of 23.2 seconds in the opening heat of the 200-meter race and went on to win the gold in the 200 in 24.0 seconds. And on the day of the 4x100 relay, so her third event, her last event, it was 110 degrees in Rome. 110. Whoa. Ugh. That is disgusting. Running, it's really gross. It's really hot. <laughs> but that was no match for the Tiger Bells. So the relay team was Martha Hudson, Lucinda Williams, Barbara Jones, and Wilma was the anchor leg. So it's the most important, right? Because she's the fastest girl on the team. Mm-hmm. So during the race, handoff number one, fine. Handoff number two, fine. Handoff number three, and then the baton gets handed to Wilma, and it's completely botched. They almost drop the baton on oh the ground, gosh. which would have disqualified them. Mm -hmm. It puts her way behind the German team. And this is, I mean, it's a four, it's a four by 100. So you, 100 meters, you don't have a lot of time to make it up. Yeah. And she somehow was able to make it up and pass the German team. And they won in 44.5 seconds. And they had previously in the semifinals set the world record at 44.4. Jeez. So she had um, tied the world record in the 100. She set a new record in the 200 and set a new record, world record in the 100 relay. Jeez. So Wilma became the first American woman ever to win three gold medals in one Olympics. That is awesome. And this is when she was crowned the fastest woman in history. <laughs> and so she, she's obviously, everybody loves her. She's getting a lot of media attention. Mm -hmm. And talk about beautiful. She was the epitome of this, like, grace and beauty. And she had this really, like, her voice was really beautiful, like, like, sweet and smooth and I just was I, I I listened to a couple of interviews with her and I thought no wonder everybody was in love with her no wonder she became a darling <laughs> so upon her return to Tennessee to the town of Clarksville they were going to put on a big huge parade home like they were going to call it Wilma Day <laughs> huge parade huge celebration yeah but Wilma said no no unless hmm. you integrate my celebration Whoa. Yeah. So the mayor of Clarkston agreed, and they uh, had the first racially integrated event in the town's history. That is amazing. Way to take that and just... Yeah, way to use your fame for a good, for a good, good reason. Yeah. So she was under quite a spotlight when she came back. She was one of the most highly visible black women in the entire world. She traveled the country and to other countries, racing in track events and speaking on television and radio, radio shows. Uh, after the Olympics, there was a French newspaper and a German newspaper who nicknamed her things like the Black Pearl, the Black Gazelle, and somebody called her the Tornado. Okay. <laughs> which I felt like, Black Gazelle, I can see. <laughs> tornado, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what that she's is. Not like, <laughs> she's, she's not like, she's not spinning and destroying she's not things. <laughs> In 1961, <laughs> she married William Ward. He was a track athlete from North Carolina College in Durham, but they did not last long. Mm -hmm. They divorced in 1963. And 1963 becomes a huge year for her. Basically, everything else I'm going to say for the rest of this entire page happened in 1963. Okay. So in 1963, she decides to retire from running Oh. at the age of 22. What? Right? <laughs> She said she wanted to leave while at the top of her game, like her hero, Jesse Owens. Okay. She didn't feel like she'd ever be able to top what she'd already done because she was like, well, let's say I go back to the Olympics and I only get two gold medals. 
there's on, there's nowhere to go but down kind that's, of thing. Yeah, that's what she felt. She felt like there was nowhere to go but down, so she might as well stop while she's ahead. Oh, come on. I know. I agree. Mm-hmm. So she also went back, you know, came back from the Olympics, continued school, and uh, in 1963, she graduated with her bachelor's degree in elementary education. After she graduated, she had just previously divorced this other guy, and now she married the father of her first child Aww. and the love of her life, her, her, uh, I was kind of hoping for that. I was like, Oh, she didn't marry him. Robert Eldridge. <laughs> and they had three more children together. Another daughter named Joanna and two boys, Robert Jr. And Zuri. And then that same year, 1963, she is appointed to be a goodwill ambassador for the U S state department and is sent on a month long trip to West Africa. Cool. So she visited Dakar, Senegal, Guinea, Mali, Upper Volta, and she attended sporting events, visited schools and hospitals and youth organizations. So she returned from her trip, came home to Clarkston, and it is the height of the civil rights protests. And in her hometown of Clarksville, there were sit-in protests that were being organized at uh, specifically at local restaurants that were denying service to black mm-hmm. patrons. So Wilma decided to join. Wow. Um, And she was participating in a multi-day sit-in at a local restaurant. And she's obviously very famous. So it's a big deal. Yeah. The local whites were violent. They were throwing things at the protesters. They created a dummy that they hung on a noose and um, smeared blood all over it to try to intimidate them. That's scary. And they also fired gunshots into the home of an, one of the major organizers, and the bullet just barely missed a child in the home. So she was putting herself at a pretty big risk, and I think the fact that she was participating in it probably um, created a little bit more media buzz than it would have otherwise. And within a week of the protests, the town desegregated their restaurants. <laughs> So it it worked. Yeah. And I think that it worked because of that. So after she stopped running, she moved around a lot. And I was trying to figure out, like, why that was, like, why she couldn't stay settled. Yeah. And I read this one piece about how it was probably difficult for her to nail down a full-time job because she was a black woman. Yeah. And so sometimes she worked as an elementary teacher because that's what her degree was in. Um, sometimes she was leading youth athletic uh, organizations. In 1977, she published her own autobiography, which she called Wilma, the story of Wilma Rudolph. Um, in 1980, she divorced from Robert and became mm-hmm. a single mother. In 81, she established the Wilma Rudolph Foundation, which was a nonprofit in Indianapolis that worked to train and educate young athletes from impoverished backgrounds or at-risk youth. That's really cool. Yeah, it was. It was, she's, you know, that was pretty cool. However, I was Googling and Googling and Googling and trying to find the Wilma Rudolph Foundation. Yeah. And I finally found a thing that keeps track of, like, nonprofit forms. Mm -hmm. And it said that they had been, like, basically denied their, like, they've been disbanded or whatever because they hadn't filed this form. Okay. So I think it doesn't exist anymore. In 1987, she finally gets, like, a really good job. She lands a terrific job. She becomes the director of the women's track program at DePauw University in Greencastle, Indiana. And she also is brought on to be a consultant on minority affairs to the president of the university. Wow. And uh, she ends up hosting a local television show. (laughs) And she is invited to become a sports commentator for ABC during the 1984 Summer Olympics. Oh, I love that. In 1990, she became the first woman to receive the National NCAA's Silver Anniversary Award, even though she was competing before the NCAA ever sponsored a women's championship. (laughs) Oh, jeez. In any sport. Yeah. In 1992, she became the vice president of Nashville's Baptist Hospital. Okay. I was like, that's a far cry from, uh, from elementary education yeah, and, and sports. And sports. <laughs> <laughs> In 1993, 
1994, at age 54, she died of brain cancer. Oh. Thousands of mourners filled Tennessee State University's Keene Hall for her memorial service. And the state of Tennessee flew their flags at half-mast. Mm, that's awesome. Everybody in the state. So over the years, her story has been told in more than 20 children's books. She has her own postage stamp. What? Um, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. She, uh, There's a big statue of her in the center of Clarksville, Tennessee. There are also, there's a stretch of Highway 24 named after her. There are streets all over the South named after her. Buildings, other major projects that have been named after her. And she's posthumously been inducted into numerous halls of fame, including the Black Sports Hall of Fame, the U.S. National Track and Field Hall of Fame, and the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame. Awesome. There were a lot of others, too, but I was like, I'm not going to name all of them. Mm -hmm. In 1996, the Women's Sports Foundation created an award in her honor that they called the Wilma Rudolph Courage Award. This award is presented to a female athlete who exhibits extraordinary courage in her athletic performance, demonstrates the ability to overcome adversity, makes significant contributions to sports, and serves as an inspiration and role model to those who face challenges, overcomes them, and strives for success at all levels. So that says a lot about what they thought of her. Mm -hmm. The first recipient of the award is Jackie Joyner Kersey. Do you know her? Yeah. So she's another great African-American female track athlete. Yes. And she's beautiful, too. She is. And I read an article that had a really great, like, summed her up. So that's how I'm going to end, too. Wilma Rudolph could not be stopped by polio, racism, or sexism, and is a role model for generations to come. Oh, that is amazing. Yeah. She sounds cool. And uh, I, so I grew up. I, I didn't know who she was. I had never heard of her. The first time I'd, I'd heard of her was very similar to Marian Anderson. Mm-hmm. I didn't know who Marian Anderson was until I became an elementary librarian. And there was this really great picture book that came out called Wilma Unlimited. It had these really incredible illustrations, too. And I read that book to kids, and I was like, this is really great. I didn't know who she was. Mm-hmm. And over the years, I've taught the 1960s to eighth graders and at the end of it they have to do an expository essay on okay. something from the 1960s it could be a person it could be a movement it could be uh, an event and so i will i always give them a very long list of people and i always put wilma rudolph on there nice and a couple of years in a row i had girls black girls who ran track who when i when i said this, uh, I would I would explain to the whole class what each of them, which each person was. yeah what each person had done, and they would be like Wilma Rudolph I want Wilma Rudolph, <laughs> and so there's this whole generation of girls who had never known of her and got a chance to know know of her, and it was funny when I so I didn't want to do her because I was like everybody knows who Wilma Rudolph is I didn't so I yeah. I texted everybody and every single person was like I don't. I, not off the top of my head, the name is familiar, but I couldn't tell you what she did. And then I texted my friend Erica. Oh. <laughs> which I shouldn't have done. But because Erica is 10 years older than me. Mm-hmm. So she was born in 1973, which meant that Wilma was still up, you know, yeah, in okay. the public eye at that point. And my friend Erica is from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I te- that was the wrong person to ask. Yeah, I texted her and she wrote back. She said, "You mean the Olympic athlete from Tennessee? <laughs> of course I know." <laughs> and then as an Be afterthought, smarty, she goes, smarty. "Oh, and she's also black." And I was like, "Yes, yes, these are all correct." And I was like, "Well, I guess." One I guess, out of... Yeah, my one friend who happens to be a black woman born in 1973 in Tennessee knows who that she is. She might know. So she <laughs> so she has... She she gets a pass. She knew who... She gets a one-up on us. But I was. I was really nervous that it was like, I think this person's too famous. No, hadn't heard. Yeah, and she's the first American woman ever to get three gold medals in one Olympics. No, I didn't know that. Well, I'm glad you know her now. Yeah, she sounds... Amazing. Oh, I forgot to tell you where I got my information from. 
So I used a little bit of Wikipedia, but I also used ESPN, which had some really cool quotes from her coaches and things like that. Cool. The National Women's History Museum, the New York Times, Black History in America, Sport in American History, and Outside Magazine. Very nice. Very cool. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed you. You enjoyed my scandal. <laughs> I liked having a scandalous woman. So I've been thinking about doing a scandalous woman. And now that you've opened the door, I, I think, think I might. I think I might do a scandalous woman. I'll do something more wholesome next time. <laughs> <laughs> something a little more inspirational. Something a little more, you know, peppy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think it's cool that she invented the bra. Miss Polly or whatever the fuck her name is at the end of her life. <laughs> She, I'm glad. It's, I'm glad she invented the bra, but man, I don't aspire to be basically a drunk. <laughs> like that's great, what with great things come. A drunk who couldn't actually complete a project. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, she's kind of all over the place. Yeah, she just bounced around. Yeah. Well, I thank you guys for joining us for another episode of I Don't Know Her. All right, come and see us, or listen to us. Come and listen to us next time. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.